So we all live in stories, don't we? We all have frames of reference for making sense of our experience and interpreting reality. Sometimes they're helpful, other times not so much. This is partly what's going on in this reading from the book of Acts from chapter 14. And, and the, the bits that we have from the lectionary today are, they cut out some important parts. So I'm just gonna read a few verses for you just so you can understand what's going on here with Paul and Barnabas. This is beginning in verse eight. So in Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet and had never walked, for he had been crippled from birth. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. And Paul, looking at him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said in a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And the man sprang up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates. He and the crowds wanted to offer sacrifice. And that's the point that Paul and Barnabas say, stop! Don't do it. <laughs> they tear their, their clothes and redirect them. So I want to just probe into this story a bit with you. So Paul is, is speaking, and this man, this man is engaging him intently, listening. Paul's imagination is caught by this man sitting there, unable to walk and sees faith in him. What did that look like? Perhaps that this man was open to the possibility of a different future, that he was yearning to be made whole, that he was hungry for something new. And in that encounter, somehow, by God's grace, he's lifted up. Now, the people in the town have their own story they're living in, their own frame of reference. Barnabas is Zeus, Paul is Hermes. They are used to thinking in terms of the Greek gods coming down to kind of mess with human life, and the way you placate the gods is to offer sacrifices to them. Paul and Barnabas invite their hearers into a better story, a more adequate story. You don't need to manipulate God through these sacrifices. And in that place, disciples are made. People come to embody this new story. They come to embody it in a way of life. Well, so our gospel from Mark should sound familiar to you, right? If you've been around here the last couple days. So before the 70 were sent, Jesus sent out the 12. Um, and so why did he need to send the 70? Maybe the 12 didn't do a good enough job, and it's like, we got to send some reinforcements here. So you had a taste of that in the neighborhood yesterday afternoon. Jesus sends them to, to dwell with, to come alongside, to live among. And notice those directions once again. Don't take any money, don't take extra food or clothing, don't take any baggage, travel lightly rely upon the provision of the neighborhood. So they go out in a kind of confident vulnerability, confident vulnerability, confidence in the peace that they offer, but also vulnerable in its sharing. For peace is like that, isn't it? It requires a certain vulnerability to share. Because it involves drawing close, close enough to be with. It's not about controlling or coercing, but rather inviting and offering. Jesus knows that if they go without baggage, they will be received differently, right? They won't come to dominate, to take over, to wield power, but instead to enter into a different kind of relationship. 
Notice, again, the real possibility of refusal. The peace may be rejected. That's all right. Shake the dust off. Move on. The peace is not lost. It returns to you. But notice some more instructions here. There's to go out and cast out demons and heal the sick. They're given authority over unclean spirits. Now that sounds like weird language to us in our world today, right? But on another level, it's not that implausible, is it? Aren't there many unclean spirits in our nation and world today? Spirits of resentment and hatred and fear? Spirits of exploitation, of scarcity, of bitterness? You know these. You see them in your social media feed, in your neighborhood, perhaps, when you turn on cable TV, perhaps even sometimes in yourself. America seems caught right now in a contest of spirits coming from all sides of the political spectrum that are tearing us apart. What does the gospel say to this? Notice again how these stories begin with the realities of human need and suffering. Paul notices this man crippled, unable to walk. In those days, he would have been isolated and marginalized as a result. Jesus sends the twelve to be healers, to touch the places of sickness, of dis-ease, of struggle, of unhealth. Who needs to be lifted up in our communities today? Where is their sickness and unhealth? What in us needs the touch of healing? But notice again how Jesus sends in vulnerability and compassion to be with. And in this encounter, God shows up between them and their neighbors. That's where the healing takes place. This is our call as church, to be communities of healing, to draw close in compassion and vulnerability, to be with our neighbors long enough to hear their stories, to listen to their longings and losses and dreams. This isn't about going out with more projects, programs, busyness, and agendas, as if our neighbors were something to check off on a, on a task list. But it's about taking the risk of being hosted, entering spaces we don't control. In the words of Emmanuel Katangale and Chris Rice, it's about unlearning speed, distance, and innocence. This is the work of reconciliation. It involves slowing down. When we do this, frames of reference, stories in which we dwell begin to shift. America is in need of some new stories, isn't it? Stories that unite, heal, and reconcile. Stories in which we don't all need to look the same or vote the same in order to belong together. Stories of grace and generosity, not fear and scarcity. Stories of abundance and hope. So I want to end with one final story. So last month I was out in um, the Diocese of Eastern Oregon at their convention, and um, it was meeting in Hood River, Oregon, right along the Columbia River. And we had been dwelling in uh, the book of Acts, but a couple chapters later, Acts chapter 16, where, where the, the disciples are, are sent on this kind of crazy journey, led by the Holy Spirit, and they end up in this town called uh, Caesarea Philippi, and um, they feel called there, and they don't really quite know where to go, but they go out by the river where they expect to find a place of prayer, and there are women gathered there. And this one woman named Lydia, you might have heard of her, remember her, right? She receives their message, and they're baptized, the women are baptized, and she invites the, the male Jewish disciples to stay in her house, right? Crossing barriers. So, so there we were in, um, in Hood River, Oregon, uh, right by the river, and so we did the, a similar thing to what you did yesterday. We did a little neighborhood walk exercise, and 
Um, people went out, it was a little warmer there last month. And so people went out and there's a marina nearby and um, people went out two by twos and this one pair, they were just wandering along this marina and they saw this boat and there's a woman there kind of working on her boat. So they came up and they just kind of struck up a little conversation with her and they were chatting with her and the woman was really curious. Well, so who are you and kind of why are you here? And, and they started talking about you know, their, their church and being Episcopalians and, and all this stuff. And the woman was really interested in, in hearing more and they got into this whole conversation that lasted for a while. And at the end, as they went to leave, they said, oh, well, oh, what's the name of your boat, by the way? She turned and she said, infinite grace. Infinite grace. God is going ahead of us preparing the way in the hearts of Lydia's all over our neighborhoods who are deep in their hunger for hope and healing in whom God is already at work powerfully calling us into relationship. So my prayer is that may God deliver us, our neighborhoods, our communities, our nation, and our world from the spirits of resentment and bitterness, from the spirits of fear and hatred, that God may open our hearts and minds to a new and better story, that we might have the courage to go without baggage, to be with, to receive God's infinite grace. Amen.